the channel I'm Chris um, today I'm going to be doing <coughs> excuse me Wellington's Triumph uh, Victoria 1813 I did the um, this is from Epic History TV this is Napoleonic Wars basically I did the 1805 to 1809 and um, there's an 1809 to 1814 which was over three and a half hours which I didn't do I started doing their battles like this and I'm pretty sure I'm not following any kind of a correct order um, so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna do the battles and and hope the best because uh, I'm I have no idea but I figure <clears throat> If I put them out in the in the accordance of their year, and I'm trying to, after I watch a video, I kind of try to feel where it's going next. Um, so I thought there was another 1812. Uh, as of right now, I haven't found it. It's kind of scattered, but um, we'll see. But until then, we're gonna go ahead and start with this video. Uh, appreciate the support, like and subscribe, um, and let's go. May 1813. While Napoleon's Grande Armée began its fight back in Central Europe following the disastrous invasion of Russia, 1,200 miles away, at the other end of Napoleon's embattled empire, another enemy was poised to strike. The previous year, Wellington's Anglo-Portuguese army had won a brilliant victory at Salamanca, but been held at Burgos and forced into a long, demoralising retreat back to the Portuguese frontier. But after a winter of rest, reinforcement and training, Wellington's army was stronger than ever. 100,000 men many of them battle-hardened veterans. And for the first time, he had sufficient cavalry and artillery, while transport and medical services had also been improved. Morale was sky-high. Their chief, known to the troops as Old Nosy, was cheered wherever he went. I never saw the British Army so healthy or so strong, Wellington informed London. In contrast, the French position in Spain was weaker than ever. Napoleon severely underestimated the threat posed by Wellington, and had just withdrawn 20,000 French troops for his own use in Germany. As commander-in-chief, King Joseph knew his forces were overstretched. Napoleon allowed him to give up Madrid, and move his capital to the more easily defended Valladolid. But withdrawing further, to a strong position like the Ebro River, was out of the question. That would send the wrong message to neutral Austria, and Napoleon's wavering German allies. And so, with serious concerns, Joseph and his Chief of Staff, Marshal Jourdan, awaited Wellington's offensive. This video is sponsored by Raid Shadow Legends, the free-to-play RPG in which you build a team of champions to battle the forces of darkness. Wellington's plan was for his army to advance in two wings, concentrate at Toro, then move against Joseph's forces. In the south, Murray's Anglo-Sicilian Spanish force, based in Alicante, had just repelled an attack by Marshal Suchet at the Battle of Castilla. Murray would now mount a diversionary landing on the Mediterranean coast, to coincide with Wellington's advance, and prevent Suchet sending reinforcements north. Wellington had also counted on large-scale support from Spanish regular forces, of which he was, since November 1812, theoretically commander-in-chief. But the Spanish Cortés, based in Cadiz, was deeply divided, with many still highly suspicious of British motives. 
The result was that Wellington would only receive direct support from a few reliable Spanish divisions. Fortunately, he would receive considerable Spanish support from the guerrillas, now better armed, organised and operating in greater numbers than ever before. A large area of Valencia had effectively been liberated by El Fraile, the friar. Esposimina had captured major towns in Navarre, and was currently keeping General Clausel's Army of the North busy, while Juan Martín Díaz, aka El Empecinado, was tying down large numbers of French troops near Madrid. On the 22nd of May, Wellington bid farewell to Portugal and began his advance. Four days later he was in Salamanca, from where he joined the northern wing of his army under Sir Thomas Graham. Joseph and Jourdan expected Wellington's main thrust to come from Salamanca, so planned to defend the line of the Douro River. But Graham's rapid advance north of the river meant they'd already been outflanked, and they ordered a retreat. By a series of brilliant marches, Wellington continued threatening the French right flank, forcing Joseph to keep falling back. Wellington's army was able to use small that was a long fallback. <laughs> roads and mountain tracks north of the main highway, which the French had dismissed as impassable. But thanks to his Spanish allies, Wellington knew better. Backed by British sea power, he was also now able to switch his supply base from Lisbon to Santander, drastically reducing the length of his supply lines, another feat the French had written off as impossible. At the Ebro River, the French found themselves outflanked yet again, and fell back to Vitoria. Here, Joseph decided that he must make his stand. The Zadora River Valley, west of Vitoria. I just want to say this. When they start the battles and they break this map out, I really dig the map. I really dig the map and just how you see the attacks coming. It's really cool. Seemed to offer a strong defensive position. Expecting an attack from the west, French forces were drawn up in three lines. General Gazan's Army of the South formed the first line. Then General Derlon's Army of the Centre, then General Rey's Army of Portugal. Joseph hoped that he could at least buy time for the vast wagon convoy assembled east of the city to get away. It contained not only military supplies, but his government's treasury. And as satirised by this contemporary British cartoon, the accumulated loot of five years French occupation of Spain, including priceless works of art, jewels and antiques. He also expected General Clausel to arrive with 20,000 reinforcements any day. However, thanks to the guerrillas, Wellington was better informed of Clausel's whereabouts than Joseph himself. Knowing that Clausel couldn't reach Joseph before the 22nd of June, he decided to attack on the 21st. The day before, French patrols reported enemy troop movement to the north, so Reyes' troops were moved to cover any threat to the army's line of communications. Apart from one division, which left to escort part of the wagon convoy to France. An odd decision that deprived the army of 4,000 men on the eve of battle. Marshal Jourdan had been bedridden with fever that day. The next morning, he reconnoitred the army's position with King Joseph. They agreed that their position was overextended and should be shortened. But by the time their orders reached General Gazan, it was too late. He was already oh, wow. under attack. Wellington, enjoying the advantage in numbers for once, had decided to attack in four columns across a ten-mile front, with General Graham's left-hand column threatening Joseph's line of retreat. It was a 
They're really spreading them thin, aren't they? Bold plan, with the potential to trap and destroy Joseph's army, but required careful coordination and precise timing. Fortunately, the French had not thought it necessary to destroy any of the bridges over the Zadora River, which really? was also fordable in several places. At 8 a.m., General Hill's column began its attack on the Allied right. Spanish and British troops advanced up the western heights of Puebla, driving off French skirmishers, and forcing General Gazan to send reinforcements to secure his left flank. Hill's troops then seized the village of Subiana, but French cannon fire and counterattacks prevented any further advance. Convinced that Hill's attack was the main assault, and that troop movements to the north were probably a diversion, Jordan continued to send troops from the centre to reinforce the left. This was exactly what Wellington wanted, but at 11am he was waiting with growing impatience for his other columns to go into action. Lord Dalhousie's 7th Division, supposed to be leading the attack by the centre-left column, had got held up in the mountains, while further east, Graham's flanking move had got off to a cautious start. But seeing the size of the approaching force, General Ray decided to pull back his troops across the Zadora River. This encouraged Graham to get things moving. Colonel Longa's Spanish division advanced on Durana, held by Spanish troops loyal to King Joseph, and a bitter struggle for the village ensued. British and Portuguese infantry advanced against Camara Mayor. They were soon engaged in bloody street fighting with the French. That's a cool painting. Or is it a picture? Panda? You're, you're playing with my mind here, man. Is this a picture? It's gotta be a painting. It's really nice though. I do like it. Look at the smoke. And the one thing I never think of is just how smoky that battlefield would be because of all the musket fire. Okay, back to the video. This scene shows an attack right by the 4th King's Own Regiment of Foot right, and the 47th right Lancashire Regiment. Sorry. Though they succeeded... Look like the one who was poking the other guy in the ass with the bayonet. <laughs> was it just me? Sorry. This scene shows an attack by the 4th <laughs> King's Own Regiment of Foot and the 47th Lancashire Regiment. Though they succeeded in driving the French out of the village, they could not cross its bridge over the Zadora, which was expertly covered by French guns. Anyone who yells rascals and villains I don't know if I like that guy or I hate him. I do, I do like him though. Around noon, a Spanish peasant informed Wellington that the bridge at Tres Puentes was completely unguarded. He immediately ordered Kent's elite light infantry brigade to dash across it and secure a bridgehead. But there was still little sign of Dalhousie's 7th Division. General Picton, the notoriously short-tempered commander of the fighting 3rd Division, ran out of patience. Fed up with waiting for Dalhousie, he ordered his men to advance. They charged across the Mendoza Bridge and a nearby ford, driving back light French defences. General Gazan, with his left flank pinned down at Subiana, was now about to be outflanked on his right and had no option but to pull back his troops. Wellington's army was now crossing the Zadora River in force. Heavy fighting continued to rage on the heights of Puebla, but here the French also had to give ground to maintain the cohesion of their new line. Scottish Highlanders and Connaught Rangers, supported by riflemen and Portuguese troops, now stormed the village of Arinyev, routing the defenders, who retreated southeast, and a gap began to emerge in the French centre between Gazan's army of the south and Derlon's army of the centre. 
the Allied advance continued, with heavy pressure on both French flanks. Oh no, there's Wellington's seven. army appeared to be building unstoppable momentum, with Graham's column poised to cut off Joseph's escape. By 4pm, Wellington's army was formed up across the Zadora, ready to strike a decisive blow. But his infantry came under heavy fire from 76 French guns, blasting great holes in their ranks. Allied guns were brought forward to provide support. The biggest artillery duel of the Peninsula War began. More than 70 guns on each side. Allied skirmishers, exploiting the gap in the French centre near Gometcha, were able to work their way behind the French guns, and shoot down their crews. Gazon found himself threatened on both flanks. But instead of trying to close up with Derlon to his north, on his own initiative he ordered a retreat, that left Derlon's own left flank completely exposed. Around the same time, Longa's Spanish troops finally captured Durana, and rumours swept the French army that their escape route had been cut. Derlon's army of the centre fought on bravely, withdrawing to another <coughs> new defensive line just one mile west of Vitoria. French guns kept up a steady fire on the advancing Allied lines, but once more the position was outflanked. This is kind of worth the, 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 not the original, but the line, excuse me, this was the line, the defensive line that they kind of should have originally, but they were spread so thin. You hope now that they bundle together, but look, these two just aren't working together, or these two. One's going to get the other one killed. Yeah, this is kind of how they should have been. I mean, you know what, what they were saying pull it in tighter around 5 30 p.m king joseph bowed to the inevitable and ordered a general retreat holy shit as the main road to france had now been cut by longa's spanish troops the army would have to retreat east towards Pamplona, along a single narrow road with boggy fields on either side. Bad enough for thousands of troops and guns, but there had been no attempt to move off the army's enormous convoy of wagons earlier in the day. The result was pandemonium, as military units and artillery tried to force their way through the streets of Vitoria and the congested lanes and fields beyond. The task of forming a rearguard fell to General Reyes, Army of Portugal, which conducted an organised withdrawal covered by its cavalry. Wellington hoped that Graham's column would now be surging across the Zadora River to cut off the French army's retreat. But Graham, overestimating the enemy's strength, continued to take a cautious approach. East of Vitoria, the French retreat descended into total chaos. The single narrow road became blocked. Wagons that took to the fields got stuck and were abandoned. Allied cavalry fell upon this confused mass, spreading panic and meeting little serious opposition. King Joseph and Marshal Jourdan themselves narrowly escaped capture. Among the abandoned wagons, many civilians, including officers, wives and children, priceless paintings, jewels and furniture, and more than five million gold francs. Troops on both sides broke ranks and dived into an orgy of plundering. <laughs> One British officer described the scene. About dusk, the head of our column came suddenly on some wagons which had been abandoned by the enemy. Someone called out, they are money carts. No sooner were the words uttered than the division broke, as if by word of command, and in an instant the covers disappeared from the wagons, and nothing was seen but a mass of inverted legs, while the arms were groping for dollars. 
For money, it certainly was. The scene was disgraceful, but at the same time, ludicrous. Wellington, however, was furious. Not only did the plundering delay pursuit of the enemy, but giant sums of cash, which might have paid for his army's supplies, vanished into private pockets instead. Of 5.5 million francs, only 250,000 were ever recovered by the army. Vitoria was a great victory for the coalition. Not as crushing as it might have been, reflected in relatively light French casualties. But in the chaotic retreat that followed, the Allies did capture all but two of 153 French guns, and even Jourdan's Marshal's Baton. French military power in Iberia was broken. The Bonapartist Kingdom of Spain was at an end. Joseph returned to France to face his brother's criticism. Marshal Jourdan retired from active service. Napoleon sent Marshal Soult to replace them, but even his shrewd military mind could not turn the tide in Spain. Counterattacks to relieve the French garrisons at Pamplona and San Sebastian were defeated. That autumn, Wellington began what proved an unstoppable advance across the Pyrenees and into France. In southern Spain, where Marshal Suchet remained undefeated, the disaster at Vitoria forced him also to withdraw towards the frontier, leaving behind just a few isolated garrisons. After a bitter five-year struggle, the Allies had brought the Peninsular War, to the Spanish their War of Independence, to a victorious conclusion. It had been a long, hard road, steeped in blood and suffering. The alliance between Britain and Spain had been particularly treacherous to navigate. But ultimately, both nations had fought together with Portugal to drive the French back across the Pyrenees. New research provides a clearer insight than ever into the huge attrition of French manpower in Iberia. An estimated total of 260,000 lives lost. Three quarters died of sickness. Of approximately 66,000 deaths from combat, 43% were in actions against Spanish regular forces. 38% fighting British-led armies, and 19% fighting guerrillas. By contrast, British military deaths are estimated at 52,000, Portuguese 15,000, with many more thousands of civilian deaths, while Spanish deaths are unknown, though the country as a whole may have lost as many as half a million lives in five years of war and occupation. For Napoleon, this disaster had been an unnecessary and largely self-inflicted wound. An intervention born of arrogance and false assumptions, with dire strategic consequences. But as the Napoleonic Empire crumbled in Spain, an even greater struggle neared its climax in Central Europe, where Napoleon faced the most powerful coalition of his enemies yet. If the French Emperor was victorious in Germany, Wellington might soon be scrambling back across the Pyrenees. The fate of Europe was about to be decided at the Battle of Leipzig. Thank okay, uh, real fast, so this is... Uh, I've done the Battle of Leipzig, and that was 1812. So, I think this is labelled incorrectly. I've done Leipzig and another one that was 1812. So I think this one was labeled incorrectly, oh, at least for the year. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but it doesn't matter because I did it. Um, so. Um, 
leave a comment and um oh that was my ankle oh it went pop oh that it cracked i didn't break it it just my ankle just popped i moved it all right uh i'm gonna watch a, another one get another one of these out of the way um but yeah um i appreciate uh, the view like and subscribe um tell a friend um make them like and subscribe and if they don't then you have my permission to punish them in any way you see fit okay sounds good we both agree uh have a good day have a good night